Michelle, um, can you show the slide deck? Thanks. So just while we're waiting for that to come up, uh, well done to George and all the team involved in, in setting up the new facility. Um, it's obviously been a great story so far. That's even before uh, the new building was put in place. Uh, I mean, that whole hub has, it just has had an extraordinary impact on certainly the medtech sector that many of us work in uh, and on the region as a whole. Um, you know, some of those examples you gave us, there's some fantastic stories uh, and successes. Uh, they didn't happen overnight. They happened over uh, a lot of years uh, and many of them started with, uh, you know, people taking um, a small space or even a desk uh, in the iHub. Uh, connecting with people in corridors and canteens, making relationships and, and maybe rejoining in other formats in, in, in later life, in, in other companies even. Uh, so it's really, really important and, and well done to everybody involved. So um, what happens inside the doors then, I suppose, of the medtech companies is, um, and there's a lot of experienced people with a lot of experiences on the line here at the moment, uh, that know that things like uh, getting yourself CE marked under medical device regulations uh, is one of those challenges that has to happen uh, many times behind those doors uh, and with a lot of hard work. So I'm just going to touch very briefly, and I mean, that's all you could do in a few minutes here on the medical device re regulation and particularly from uh, a startup innovation company type perspective in terms of the bigger chunks of work uh, that need to be done in the coming months as the medical device regulation comes into force in uh, May of 2021. Next slide, Michelle, thanks. So um, as I said, it's it's just uh, touching on uh, the MDR, the medical device regulation from a product development startup perspective, uh, touching on uh, the impact it may have on your technical file uh, and your documentation that you may have to submit uh, to notified bodies. Uh, some of the QMS or quality management system preparation that you may have to do uh, in advance of, of uh, CE marking and being compliant with the MDR itself. Uh, some regulatory authority uh, interfacing issues uh, that you may encounter. And then, of course, uh, last but certainly not least for the startups is uh, when do I time things? Um, you know, when do I need to spend money, uh, particularly on resources for implementing requirements? So we'll just touch on, on each of those uh, over the next few minutes. Next slide. So my own background, uh, George touched on it briefly. Um, I, I work in two formats. Um, I've got a companion QMS. It's, it's an electronic quality management system uh, solution that I provide to the medtech sector. Uh, and I provide um, quality and regulatory consultancy to the sector as well. So I've done that for over 100 companies in, in eight countries uh, going back to 2008. And I do that by providing regulatory compliance consultancy uh, helping companies to implement or improve their, their quality management systems in the medtech sector, um, and then uh, using companion QMS, the electronic quality management system solution, to bind together that, that knowledge and the compliance requirements uh, into an efficient solution for helping companies to bring their product to market and to keep them uh, on the market. Next slide, Michelle, thanks. So in terms of uh, some initial steps, uh, if, if you're a company um, that's planning to apply for CE marking on the under the medical device regulation, um, one of the things that, that occurs uh, at the beginning of this journey is to document what devices you're planning to bring uh, to the European Union. Uh, what, are you, what are you intending to CE mark? So sometimes, uh, particularly when a, when a startup organization arrives to the likes of myself or some of the others on the call in terms of uh, you know, asking, well, how am I going to get this device to market? What do I need to do to conform uh, with the medical device regulation requirements? Well, what you can do for yourself, and it's really crucial, is to document your device description, be really clear in terms of illustrations and text about what you want to bring to market, um, review your competitor products, because sometimes you can learn a lot about what they've done, what they've done successfully to bring a product to market, and sometimes by aligning yourselves with what they've done, uh, you can have an easier route uh, to market um, uh, you know, when you eventually get your, to submitting your technical file for approval. Uh, defining your intended use is often something that, that companies leave behind at an early stage, but it is hugely important. And anybody who goes to the US market knows that one of the first steps you have to cross if, for example, you want to use a similar device as part of your regulatory pathway for getting into the market is you need to have the same intended use as one of those competitor products. 
you don't have to have the same design, but having the same stated intended use can open a lot of initial doorways for you. So that is an important uh, statement to capture, and it becomes particularly uh, important later when it comes to classifying a device uh, in the European Union under the MDR, but also uh, uh, in the United States market as well, which is the other large market in the world. All of that helps you uh, either uh, yourself or with uh, the internal resources that you have on the regulatory front or perhaps uh, regulatory resources that you hire to, to map out a regulatory pathway to CE marking under the MDR. And there are changes between the MDD and MDR, so it is necessary to recap on, uh, review the MDR and with your device description, determine what is necessary for your particular device. The good news or the bad news is that the MDR, the medical device regulation is freely available online. So there isn't any excuse for not having a look at it, no matter what uh, aspect of a company that you're supporting. And plus, I suppose that really helps you in terms of uh, if you want to question uh, and work with your regulatory expertise to figure out, have we got the right strategy here? Uh, have we put the right pathway in place for, for our particular device? Well, why not make yourself familiar with that medical device regulation uh, and you too can understand uh, what's necessary to bring the device to market. Thanks, Michelle. Next slide. So uh, one of the things that's changed und under the uh, MDR is the uh, device classification. So there have been several changes. I'm not going to go down into the the, the weeds in terms of uh, what has changed in each one of the rules. But just to point to, uh, again, it's all um, clearly written in English. It's in Annex uh, 7 of the M MDR. And once you've decided what your intended purpose uh, of your medical device is, uh, then you will be able to use and apply those rules for determining the classification for your device. The classification headings themselves remain the same at 1, 2A, 2B and 3, and that's a, a rising level of risk for each classification. Uh, and once you've established your intended purpose, your device description, then you should be able to establish, based on that class classification, what your overall regulatory pathway uh, will be for CE marking. Next slide. So some likely regulatory pathway and requirements based on your device classification could be similar to the following. And again, these are, are very high level, but they give you some idea of, of, of key milestones that you may have to achieve depending on the type of device that you have. So if you take the first role, um, which is a class one device, which could include something like a, a surgical face mask that we're unfortunately too familiar with the inside of them. Uh, more recently. Uh, something like a surgical face mask. Uh, I worked on a couple of those projects last year. Uh, there is an obligation to, to assemble a technical file. There is an obligation to have a, a quality management system, all, albeit not as extensive uh, as what you might need for a higher risk device. Uh, but there isn't an obligation to have a 13485 certified system um, um, certified by a notified body. There isn't an obligation to submit that technical file to a notified body, uh, but that company will be obliged um, to register and list their product with the competent authority, which in Ireland would be the HBRA. And it's highly unlikely uh, that they will be um, obliged to have clinical, clinical data as part of approving that device uh, under the MDR. At the other end of the scale, in the bottom row, a class three device, uh, the requirements are much more extensive. Um, uh, the technical file, while uh, on the outside may look uh, similar, certainly the, the level of detail required within a technical file for a higher risk device will be uh, significantly more than what you would need for a lower class of device. Similarly, for a quality management system, uh, while the overall framework might be similar, the actual internal requirements and control uh, in a risk-based approach will be much more extensive. Uh, you will be obliged um, to, to have an ISO 13485 certified system uh, and a notified body of your choice, providing their MDR designated, uh, can provide you with that 13485 certification. Uh, you will also be obliged to submit a technical file, which is in a nutshell is a summary of what, what's happened in your design control process. You will be obliged to submit that to the notified body for, for their approval and concurrence with your recommendation that this device should be CE marked. Um, and by virtue of the fact that, you, that you're going to need uh, clinical data and proof to back up this device, um, you will be engaging with, with competent authorities, possibly Ireland and elsewhere, uh, if you run clinical trials in other jurisdictions. 
Uh, one of the things that, that is uh, coming up for, for companies that are, are now on this journey uh, to MDR compliance is, uh, is that there uh, has been new expert committees uh, formed by the European Union to review whether our, our uh, clinical strategies and, and data is sufficient for placing devices on the market. So those committees were, have literally been formed in the last few weeks. Um, and companies have now started engaging with those expert committees to determine um, whether they've got a, a clinical pathway uh, that's going to be appropriate for approval under the MDR. Next slide, Michelle. So uh, how do I prepare an MDR compliant technical file? Well, there is a significant amount of, of detail to, to doing this and, and achieving it, uh, but you can certainly help yourself by, by taking an approach of preparing a technical documentation template at the earliest opportunity because uh, there is so much to, to take on board uh, that it is certainly necessary to determine what the goalposts are to map that out in a template and you can do that by reviewing the MDR requirements themselves uh, seeking out within that legislation wherever it mentions technical documentation determine is that something that I need to put into my template and into my end requirements um, notified bodies uh, can be really, really helpful in this regard now. Uh, a lot of them have taken uh, a very welcome initiative to actually provide you with um, an overall template of what their expectations are in regard to what you need in a submission to them. So that's very helpful uh, and I would recommend that any company that is engaging with a notified body uh, seeks out uh, any specific requirements they have. You may find that they've already got a prepared template for you. There's also uh, existing medical device coordination group guidance available uh, and all of these items are available freely online if, if you search for them. Uh, and the old MedDev guidance is also still available. So if you Google that, uh, you should be able to find uh, what you need uh, for creating the technical documentation that you need uh, for, for the MDR. So with, with a template like that assembled, uh, then you're, you're in a position um, to apply your design control process and eventually that technical file and technical documentation that you need to submit to the regulatory authorities will be extracted from the design control records that you complete uh, along the journey. Next slide, Michelle. Thanks. So some other uh, implications in for your technical file may include, and, and, and this is based on a couple of uh, interactions that I've already had with notified bodies, that their expectations up front uh, in your technical file uh, is to tell them um, and show them how you've applied the MDR requirements for, for a summary of safety and clinical performance, which will eventually be, be published uh, and available to the public. Uh, how you've applied your post-market surveillance requirements and your post-market clinical follow-up requirements, um, what, what your arrangements are for the uh, periodic safety update report, um, how you've applied what's called the GSPR, which has now replaced the old Annex 1 essential requirements review, uh, and last but certainly not least, um, the clinical evidence. Uh, and that uh, may require you to engage with an expert panel committee early in the design cycle so that you can determine what will their view be uh, and will it concur with your view that you may or may not need uh, clinical data in the form of a clinical trial uh, before you submit your technical file. Next slide, Michelle. On the QMS side of it, which is really your, your control procedure arrangements for, for getting you through the journey and helping everybody to stay on the one hymn sheet, uh, you will be subject to an MDR compliance audit uh, by the notified body. And so far, in my experience, that has been a, a separate and unique audit uh, of each company. In other words, uh, they may have already been um, um, uh, having ISO 13485 specific compliance audits. Uh, but in my experience so far, the notified bodies have been having a separate uh, medical device regulation specific compliance audits. So you can anticipate that uh, in the near future if you're intending to conform with the MDR. Um, and all of that has to be achieved before the product is CE marked. Um, I suppose uh, there isn't any uh, quick fix here to conforming with the medical device regulation. Uh, it requires some or several on your team to do a clause by clause preparation uh, and merging of MDR requirements into the quality management system. Uh, that you're developing uh, and eventually you will also need um, to uh, integrate uh, auditing of the MDR into your overall quality management system as well. So before you even reach that uh, MDR compliance audit, 
uh, that will be conducted by a notified body, you should confirm for yourselves uh, and, and with your own auditing system that you've actually um, uh, conformed with the requirements. Next slide, Michelle, thanks. So uh, other watch outs along the way are um, that uh, not all notified bodies are, are medical device regulation designated. And again, this is something that, that you can you can find on the Internet. Um, it's updating almost monthly at this stage in terms of uh, who has been successfully designated to apply the MDR. So uh, this has come as a big shock to a couple of my clients where uh, they've kicked the can down the road and assumed maybe that a notified body that they were working with uh, would be MDR designated and that may not occur. So. We're very uh, close to the deadline now, and if somebody hasn't been MDR designated already, then I think you need to choose carefully if you haven't already selected a notified body to go forward with. Um, in overall terms, I would certainly say seek some performance references about notified bodies from your peer group, and that's where the likes of the IA Hub can be very, very helpful. It only takes a short conversation with some of your neighbours, whether it's virtually or otherwise, to just see what their experiences have been with notified bodies. Um, and some uh, have significantly stepped up performance uh, and others uh, less so over the years. So I think it's really important that you choose carefully. Um, the other th significant watch out is, uh, is to watch that that um, notified body that you choose, this really vital partner that you're going to need for the next few years, has a technical competence for your product. And that's also listed in a general way. Um, under the MDR designation on the European Union website, uh, ec.europa.eu. Uh, but you should also, again, as part of your referencing, see do they really have that expertise in, it could be software, orthopedics, or whatever it is uh, that your device uh, is working towards. Uh, and remember that uh, I, while you can obviously use a, a notified body and separate notified bodies for your technical file review and for your quality management system audits, that's an extremely rare thing. So what you're engaging with and, and, and how you engage with this notified body is going to be so vital for your both your technical file review and your quality management system audits uh, over the next few years. So it's a really, really important decision um, uh, and, and make it carefully. Next slide. So um, last few things here, I suppose uh, in summary, um, I would strongly suggest uh, assembling a regulatory pathway if you haven't already done so for either existing or, or planned devices uh, and determine based on that what you need to do in your organization because it's not the same for everybody. There are different requirements for different devices uh, and particularly related to device classification. Uh, clinical requirements, um, this uh, could turn out to be very significant in terms of your, your pathway to approval. So it's very important that you, as early as possible, get the clinical expertise on board that you need for your product, determine your strategy, and it may require you, and this is where maybe um, the, the clinical expertise can advise you, it may require you to engage with an expert committee sooner rather than later to determine uh, whether your clinical strategy is likely to, to wash, so to speak when you submit your technical file. Um, obviously, as a, as a startup company, um, you will have project goals um, align your MDR milestones with that. Um, you know, don't implement your quality management system too early. Time the implementation and the phases of implementation uh, of MDR requirements and any other requirements with the project goals and with your deadlines for, for clinical trials uh, and for submissions. Uh, use somebody's electronic quality management system. I'd like you to certainly to use mine, Companion QMS, uh, but certainly don't go without one. It's really significant and extremely difficult task um, to, to, to CE mark or to get FDA approval now uh, without using the efficiency of an electronic quality management system solution. Very differently, uh, employ either uh, as employees or, or as part-time resources, be they consultants or otherwise, people with expertise in this area. Um, and then look out for uh, scheduling your, your implementation and your notified body audits for both 13485 and MDR um, in parallel with getting your technical file submission in. Uh, and that, that way you can just make sure that, that the compliance side of things uh, isn't in some way holding up your project as you go towards uh, approval. And then last but not least, that previous slide I mentioned, uh, choose your notified body uh, carefully. Uh, make sure that they can deliver on time with, with the plan that you have for your project goals. Next slide. 
So, yes, and that's it. And if I can provide you with any more assistance at any stage, uh, please feel free to email me on info at companionqms.com. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Frank, Frank, very, very much, much for that. For that. Um, um, you gave us you a, gave great a great summary, summary the in what steps, steps involved in conformance for the MDR, MDR and the, the device classification. So, so we'll take, we'll a, take question a question or two, or two I think, at think at this stage. stage. And, and, and you also you mentioned also the new expert <laughs> committees. You might say a word or two just on expand on that if you can. Frank, sorry, you're on mute. Uh, yeah, thanks, Michelle. Uh, yeah, as as others on the call will probably have experienced already, um, during last year, um, uh, expert committees, uh, we didn't know what to do and who to turn to here because they actually were only uh, appointed uh, in the last few weeks. So uh, th those committees started appearing during December and January. Um, they are experts from around Europe uh, who will review, you know, if you have an orthopedic device, for example, there is an orthopedic committee uh, where your, uh, your proposed clinical strategy uh, can be reviewed by that committee and you can decide in association with that committee whether you've got the right strategy, uh, enough data, enough patients lined up uh, that will be acceptable to them at a later date. So that's something that's an entirely new. Uh, it's new for everybody here. It's, uh, you know, I'm not sure if anybody on the call has experienced it just yet, uh, but that's going to be a brand new experience for every company as part of, of um, CE marking under the MDR. OK, thanks. Is there any question that anyone wants to put in? I know we'll, we'll be able to take them via the chat or indeed a, a direct question. Um, one other point, Frank, is, is in relation to a lot of the, the startups um, and I suppose the, the type of skill or talent that they need at the very early stage on the journey to start implementing the, the medical device regulations. I mean, can they start with, with no one in their quality regulatory area initially and then bring in that talent as, as they go along? What would you suggest there? Yes, they certainly can and, and most do. And, and again, many people on the call here will have done that. Uh, but uh, I would say very few uh, start and finish successfully without getting at least some part time expertise uh, early on. So uh, it is certainly very important because you want all of those key compliance related milestones covered uh, as part of the journey. Uh, so it is important to at least get part time expertise and generally, uh, and there's a few of us who provide that part time expertise on the call here. We generally flag it to companies when we think, hang on, uh, you know, you're at the point where you need full time resources here. We should leave your nest. Uh, you need uh, to employ somebody full time from now. OK, OK, thanks, Frank, for that. So we'll, we'll move on now to the second speaker for today. Um, so the second speaker is Mark Retex and Mark is a director at Myriad Associates and he is responsible for the quality and delivery of all grant application clients in Ireland, the UK and Europe. Mark has an enviable track record in securing funding for SMEs, third level institutions and startups, including several IHUB clients. Mark will give us an update now on the grant funding landscape for 2021. Uh, and we welcome Mark to this event. Morning, everybody. Uh, Thank you very much for inviting me along. Um, <clears throat> so I'm currently working from home with both children and a dog, so I cannot guarantee that we won't have visitors at any moment or maybe several times. Um, I think since 2012, I've been coming to um, Ireland for about every four weeks, um, but I haven't obviously been now uh, for a year. Um, and it's fantastic to see how much the iHub has changed in a year um, and actually seeing some of the clients really flourishing and growing in the iHub, Endwave, Origin, Rockfield, Kite, just to name a few. Um, but I'll, I'll try to rattle through um, my slides um, this morning. What I'm going to talk about is, is quite new, um, probably live as of Friday um, last week, and some more information is coming out over time. So what I'm going to do is I haven't covered everything because I've only got 15 minutes or so, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to put together some supplementary slides 
and I'll send them to Michelle to give you a much broader overview of everything that's going on. Um, could you start the first slide, please, Michelle? Yep, sorry. Yeah, could you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so what I'm just going to go through this morning is a quick overview um, about how things have changed, really. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the developments from Horizon Europe, a little bit about Enterprise Ireland, um, and I probably won't get time to go through the team details at the end. Um, can you go on to the next slide, please, Michelle? Um, so the big change is Horizon, Euro, uh, Horizon 2020 fundamentally finished in December um, and the new um, incarnation is Horizon Europe, circa 100 billion um, in funding um, and it's, it's split really into three pillars. Um, I'm going to focus mainly on pillar three today but in the supplementary slides that I send round, I'll also put um, some information about Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Um, so when I'm talking about Pillar 3 this morning, um, I'm going to focus mainly on the European Innovation Council, um, which a lot of people in Galway will know about, that that is the replacement for the Horizon 2020 SME instrument phase two and the EIC um, accelerator pilot. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? Um, so the European to so the EIC um, program, which before was the EIC accelerator and the fast track to innovation has completely changed. Um, unfortunately, the fast track to innovation is no more. Um, which is a shame because it's been very popular uh, medtech in Galway. Um, but the EIC now has been split into three different segments. It's the Pathfinder, um, Transition and Accelerator. So I'm going to focus a little bit today, more today on the Pathfinder and the Accelerator and I will send some supplementary slides on the Transition Actions, which is the middle box. Now, I think there has been some information released on transition um, actions yesterday, which I think will be very interesting um, for not only um, GMIT, but also the companies in the iHub because it, it provides a really nice opportunity for an innovation partnership um, and funding for, for those two entities to work together. And it's 100 percent funded. Um, so I will send some supplementary slides around about that afterwards. Could you go on to the next slide, please? So firstly, I'll go through um, the Pathfinder. So what you'll find is uh, quite a change within Horizon Europe is whenever they bring out a new competition, they will generally split that competition into two and there will be an open, uh, a bottom up um, pathway and there will be a challenge stroke theme based um, side as well. Um, so the Pathfinders, um, they then also split the budget between the two. So for the open side, it's circa 170 million um, this year in 2021, and it's about 133. I think that might increase a little bit for the theme side. Um, it's generally up to about a three million budget per project um, but there are specific cases where that can be up to four million. Um, it requires um, a consortium uh, approach and that requires three different legal entities from three different member or associated countries. Now that's solely for eligibility purposes. Um, interesting point here is the um, UK is an eligible um, country. However, if you are looking to have the UK in your consortium, please don't rely on their inclusion for eligibility um, because it is a it is a moving feast. Also, uh, US companies are eligible partners, 
but they will be unable to um, sign the grant agreement and receive direct monies from the Commission. Um, academic and enterprise, or, or basically academic and for-profit companies are, are eligible. Um, and the, the projects are, um, are deemed to, to span technology readiness levels one to four. But that doesn't mean you have to be at one and transition to four. You can be at anywhere in between. I would say technology readiness level four would not include preclinical. I would say that would be benchtop only. Um, and the deadlines are in May and October of this year. So May will be for the open and October will be for the themed calls. Um, next slide, please. Um, so there are a variety of these challenges within the Pathfinder. Again, I won't go through all of them. Um, I'll just go through a couple of them. Um, main reason is you don't particularly understand some of the challenges, but I will send them to your supplementary slides. I, I think this one will be very interesting, um, especially for companies in Ireland. Um, and it's one of the, the challenges is emerging technologies and cell and gene therapy. And it actually spans both sides, um, all the way from um, improving uh, adoptive cell therapies and um, bringing um, therapies to a, to the clinic, um, but it also um, goes um, down as far as improving gene therapy, manufacturing processes and production, of which there are a number of companies in Galway that, that are looking at this. So that's just one of the challenges. Um, next slide, please. Um, the, an, another one is um, around green hydrogen, and it's a very clear, very, very um, narrow um, scope. Well, it's the cell and gene therapy one that we've just looked at is wide. This one is very clear, it is to generate a proof of concept of validated green hydrogen uh, production technology. Um, so next slide, please. Um, and the final one that I'll go through um, is engineered living uh, materials. Um, and again, it's a very um, quite a narrow scope from proof of principle technologies um, to a lab validated um, and computer aided design test and learn platform. I won't go in, in, into the, the challenges in any more detail really than that. Could you go through the next slide, please? Um, so that's the, the Pathfinders, quite early stage. Um, we believe the overall success rate will be circa 10% for the Pathfinders, um, based on comparative calls that have gone before. Um, but now I'll go through the EIC um, accelerator. Um, a lot of people in the building will, will know about this already, and it is the replacement for the previous EIC accelerator and SME instrument uh, phase two. Again, there's themed and open calls, um, but the budget is considerable. It's 600 million just for this year. Um, it's a, as before, uh, this is a single company application is not eligible to apply as a consortium but again the same as before you can have a degree of subcontract vendors material suppliers service providers um, contributing towards the project it's up to two and a half million in grant at a 70 percent funding level plus a standard 25 percent overhead in very rare occasions will the Commission um, allow you to apply for more than that. Um, and there is also up to a 15 million co-funded equity portion. Now this bit is important because this was uh, this is a change from before. The Commission um, are, would like to, it appears, contribute a maximum of 50% of any equity requirement um, that, that a company needs. And the equity is used for technology readiness level eight activities onwards. So scale up, potential large scale pivotal trials and commercialization. 
but they won't lead around. What they want to do is they want to co-lead with either one or a number of private investors. Now I could talk for about an hour about this, but the, the detail behind this um, equity um, side will be on the supplementary slides that I send around to people. Could you go to the next slide, please? Um, so just um, I'll rattle through this quickly. The deadline for both. Um, so the EIC accelerator now is a three step process. There's a short form application, a main application and then an interview. The main application deadlines that we'll have two this year, one on the 9th of June and one on the 6th of October. Um, and the short form application, um, this was actually officially launched on Friday um, of last week and people are learning about this all of the time. So for this short form application, um, the European Commission in partnership with a private company have developed an AI screening tool that you put um, you input some um, data points onto a onto a tool and it will provide you and the evaluators with a rank between A and D, A being the highest and D being the lowest of how technically advanced your concept is and how innovative your concept is. And what this AI um, tool does, it will match the data that you put onto the portal against the patent database published scientific papers and previously funded um, projects. So we're trialing this AI system at the moment. We think we found um, a formula. Um, we're going to be keeping on these trials the next couple of days and I will circulate my findings um, to everybody. Um, so secondary to this screening tool, this is a short form application um, and you have uh, 13 questions to answer and you have a thousand characters to answer per uh, each question. Now that's a thousand characters, including spaces. Um, there is also a 10 slide associated PowerPoint and a three minute video. Really important thing about the PowerPoint is normally when we put a PowerPoint slide uh, a presentation together, it's so you can present it. Whereas this, you will never ever get to present it. So um, see this as an associated document to the thousand character questions, because the thousand characters will not allow you to have any images, any references, graphs, tables, etc. So use those 10 slides to supplement your questions. Um, your evaluation um, is conducted by four um, people remotely and you don't get scores anymore. So there's not this, how many points do I get out of 15? You either get a go or a no go. And out of the four evaluators, you need to get a go from two of them only. Um, the driving force behind this is what the Commission wants to do is they want to screen out 70% of those applications that, 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 that will never make it, will, that will never get funded. Um, it's a two to four week evaluation period. Two weeks looks quick to me. I would have thought three to three to four weeks. Um, and we don't know much information um, about the main applications yet. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, just very quickly on the um, on, on the themes on the challenges for the EIC accelerator. Um, strategic health and digital technologies, you can see that there. Um, point of care diagnostics, novel approaches and cell and gene therapy, particularly for cancer. Um, uh, bio developments, medical practices and ICU applications. I, I have a feeling that this will capture a lot of the pandemic related applications that will that will be submitted um, this year. Next slide, please. Um, and this and, and the, the second challenge is the Green New Deal. Um, and that is split between battery technologies, green hydrogen, 
energy efficient building um, and of course there's got to be some carbon capture technologies in there as well so two themes green new deal and strategic digital and health technologies uh, next slide please so just a, a quick summary of these changes much bigger budget which is a, a, which is so welcomed because horizon 2020 ran out of budget uh, at, at the end um, there's this co-investment opportunity with the equity from the commission and private sources you only have a two submission limit now for each stage and if you're unsuccessful on your second submission at any one of the stages then you have a cooling off period of a year um, I talked to you about the, the, sh the short application phase you now and again I'll, I'll send some supplementary slides in here you can require apply for equity only and grant first or grant plus equity now the equity only um, angle might be very interesting for those companies who have already got horizon 2020 projects they can apply for this side to kind of supplement what they're doing sorry i'll speed up i'm running over next slide please um, just a little bit about the um, the DTIF program um, administered by Enterprise Ireland. Um, I won't go through all the statistics there, but we're just waiting um, for the results for for round three. It is very competitive, but it is one of the highest success rates out there of everybody. Um, and I know a lot of companies in G GMIT and around Galway do very well. So just very quickly, it's a 50% funding level. It's an open theme, so there's no specific challenges. Um, it's 100% funded for RPOs and universities. Um, two stage application, main application and an interview. We believe the deadline will be round uh, for round four will be towards the end of the year or Q3, Q4. And you need a three party minimum consortium or within Ireland. Um, and technology readiness level four to seven. Um, next slide, please. Um, key bits, and I'll just pick the most important bits. Industrial research activities are key. So under the, the DTIF, they want to um, fund highly disruptive um, projects that is generating industrial research. Now, industrial research is designated in generating new knowledge which will lead to the acquisition of new skills, new jobs, etc. Um, really important here is to align very clearly with the National Strategic Outcomes of Ireland, the Irish Research Agenda and the Ireland Climate Action Plan as well. Um, next slide, please. Now, this I'm not an expert in this area, um, but I have um, looked at this a little bit. I think you, you, there are many, many funding avenues um, from Enterprise Ireland, um, unlike in the UK. Um, so several areas, the Agile Innovation Fund, the Research Development and Innovation Fund. Um, please speak to your development advisor about these i think i noticed scepter um, came onto the call it it's it's really interesting funding opportunity for you um for the for relatively short term um development projects for you um next slide please and also everything that we've talked about so far has all built has all been competitive in nature. Please make sure that you're maximising your tax credits because it, it's an entitlement for you. Um, I know everyone knows about um, R&D tax credits, but there's a couple of things that have just changed. SME rate was increased by 5% up to 30% um, from the 1st of January. And generally those um, credits or the cash refunds were split over three installments over three years however very recently this has changed 
where you can get your second and third cash instalment in the same year. All you need to do is request this by the um, online um, system, the ROS. It's something that you guys can do yourselves. Um, next slide, please. Ah, and that's and that's the team here at uh, Myriad. We've got Lauren, it's based out in the US. Um, Ratman and myself are are based um, in the uh, in, in the UK. Um, and I'm still trying to get the family to come with me to go away, and they're still not having it. Um, that's that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much. Um, any questions would be welcome. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, and, and maybe Michelle, we'd, we'd bring on Mark and Frank just as a couple of questions have, have come in here. Um, so, yeah, and Mark, we, we should do something about getting you to Galway. My God, um, I see it's, it's a passion of yours there. So um, you've, been over, you've been over here often enough. Um, we should be able to do something to get you here permanently. Just a Thanks. question uh, that has come in for you, um, Mark, in relation to and you've 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 given us a good overview on the the new horizon europe details particularly the pillar 3 and i noted that um you'll you'll send some supplementary information on pillar 1 and 2 which we yeah. will send out to the to the audience for you and thanks for that the question was around um the the biggest change or impact for irish medtech startups with the horizon europe if you were to pick one change or impact, what do you think it would be? Wow. I, th I think it's the themes. I, I, I think having some of the, um, I, I think there's, there's, there's more avenues. Um, there's a much bigger budget. And some of the themes, especially for years one and two, healthcare, medtech, biotech will be a will be a central theme so i think the biggest change is there's more budget and there's more avenues to um to to investigate okay and the, the second question is is maybe related to it it's um for, for people that would have previously applied for the fti which is now mm -hmm. not there you know where where do they go now what, what's the appropriate um, pitch for them well, it, it's unfortunate um, that um, that the FTI is, is no longer. Um, and actually, the if you look at the essence behind um, an, an FTI, the main thrust of um, was it has to be you have to prove that it can be commercial the output within two years at the end of the project. Now. In, in that kind of avenue, there isn't anything within um, Horizon Europe. So the probably the closest two are the EIC accelerator, um, which is the one that I, I, I detailed quite, um, quite 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 a lot, but also the EIC transition. Now, the the EIC um, transition is, um, and I'll send some information around about this is you can only access that EIC transition if you have completed um, a, a previous particular kind of project. And these specific projects are European Research Council grants or um, future enabling technology grants. So if so there's replacement for the FTI with a partnership, if any of the SMEs or um, GMIT have completed um, a European Research Council grant, then they can partner together and they can look at the transition action. I, I will send some information around about this in the next couple of days because I think it's an important development and, and, a, and a really good opportunity um, because you don't need different countries. Yes, and I suppose people are grappling a little bit with the change when they were so used to the, the fast track of innovation and it was uh, so successful, I suppose, for people here um, locally. Just a, a question for Frank is in relation to, is there a typical timeline in relation to the preparation, Frank, for a technical file? 
is there a typical sort of a window or timeline you could give to uh, a new startup to say, look, this is this is what's involved here? Um, you certainly set the tough questions, George. Uh, it, it varies so much. It really does, George. Uh, it, it's all down to the particular type uh, of device. On the, the more predictable side of it is probably the quality management system preparation side of things. Uh, and, you know, without undercutting it, I would say somebody should allow themselves a year to, to actually um, make sure that they incrementally uh, prepare, update the QMS requirements, first of all. And then you have to demonstrate evidence of the application of requirements, which takes time as well. Um, so uh, all of that, I would say, just automatically uh, off the top of my head factor in a year for it. But look, at it, it happens and it has happened and it is happening that companies need to do it more quickly. Uh, and if they do and they have to do it in a hurry, then it certainly can be reduced to months. But then that's just sucking in resources that maybe somebody needed uh, on their technical team. And um, so you've got to be careful. So it's certainly a case of uh, take a look at all the requirements, plan it out and then slip it in where you're not cutting across vital preparation for clinical trials or vital design verification testing that needs to happen, that you're actually weaving uh, the uh, the requirements for, for conforming to the MDR, um, you know, in and out between other key milestones that you, that you have to achieve along the way. Okay. And indeed, sure, you, your, your quality management system software would help to try and pull the strands of all that together and, and give them a system going forward. Okay. The final question here was, in relation to tax credits and maybe each of you might have an input on it but it was in relation to do you feel that irish startups again medtech this came from um that they're applying for the r d tax credits in uh, enough of them and if if they're not what could we do to help more to apply to get the tax credit uh, I I think a, a good portion of the medtech companies in, in Galway, they are applying for their tax credits. Um, and I think the people that are not applying, they probably think that they're not eligible. Um, so I think about raising a little bit of awareness that um, of what constitutes R&D, um, I, I think I think would drive that. The, also probably something that actually uh, is a factor to stop people um, applying is it can be very very slow um, to, to get to get the funds back um, and people might think oh, I'm not sure that the reward is worth the time but I think just reminding people that this is an entitlement um, if they're not claiming their competitors probably are. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And Frank, do you want to add anything to that on the tax credits? Is it an area that that, that you're involved in? Or... Um, no, I have nothing to add in that area. I think that's Mark's area of expertise. Yeah, and I noted there, Mark, like you had the word entitlement like underlined. So um, maybe uh, more people do need to get it because uh, uh, while it is somewhat maybe cumbersome, it's a significant benefit. So I want to wrap up now um, I want to thank a number of people for today's event. I want to especially thank Frank and Mark for coming along today virtually and for doing the presentations. We will send out the slides to the audience and indeed the uh, additional information from Mark will we'll send that also. I also want to thank the people who logged on this morning yourselves for taking the time out to hear uh, updates in relation to the regulation and the funding landscape. I want to thank uh, Turlock and Michelle here, part of my own IHUB team, for helping us to set up and to plan and to run and to manage the event. And finally, just to, a note is to say that next Thursday at lunchtime, we're, we're running another uh, event in relation to supply uh, chain for MedTech and Oliver Healthcare Packaging will talk about their products and services and how they're used and we'll send details of that if you're interested um, to, the, to the audience today. So look, without further ado, I'd like to thank everyone for coming along 
and um, looking forward to the day and time when we can bring you into the IHUB building and actually do the tours post-COVID. Thank you very much.